what matters to agents and to agent designers. If you're walking past a hill with a couple of objects tumbling down towards a wall, you may watch the rock on the left just crash mindlessly into the wall, whereas the sheep on the right at the last moment diverts and goes through the gap. You may think the gap matters to the sheep. You can test this by different experiments with the gap in different places. Never matters to the rock, matters to the sheep where the gap is. Agents have things that matter to them that need not be physical. A gap is not actually physical. Artificial life is largely about understanding what it is to be an agent. And lots of artificial life is a waste of time through failing to understand the philosophical framework in which you must understand agents. Simple A-Life agent, Breitenberg Vehicle 2B, two photoreceptors at the front, two wheels at the back, the brain is limited at just those two diagonally crossed wires, such that when there's more light in the left photoreceptor, the right wheel goes faster than the left, and hence the vehicle will turn towards the light. If you carry the light around, the vehicle will follow you. The light matters to the vehicle, just as the gap matters to the sheep. If you walk across a road, you tend to treat the cars and vehicles as agents, even if you can't see the driver. In this case, this is an animation of autonomous vehicles. There is no driver. Nevertheless, they are acting as agents with things that matter to them, including, where possible, not crashing into you. Another agent was something that matters to it, the fuel gauge in your car. Very simple agent, what matters to it is notifying you when the fuel is dangerously low. When you try and understand how a complex system works, the brain maybe, or here a printed circuit board, divide and conquer through functional decomposition is the standard technique. Carve it up into different modules, doing particular job uh, particular functions and see how they fit together. Also described as homuncular decomposition where you're thinking of the different modules as homunculi, little imps or agents, each with a job to do, each with things that matter to them and they're communicating with each other. Let's analyse the Brightonboro vehicle in this way. Clearly the vehicle as a whole is an agent that follows the light. That's what matters to the agent as a whole. If you look at a small component part, for instance, just the left wheel, that is, metaphorically speaking, another little agent with a, a limited job of adjusting the left wheel speed. When you carve a system up into different agents, you must keep it clear the difference between what their different functions. So the left agent is not following the light, the, the uh, vehicle as a whole is following the light. Unfortunately, many people get the parts and the whole confused. This is called the myriological uh, fallacy, or I just call it a category error. So too many people think that because I know how to ride a bicycle, my brain, or maybe part of my brain, knows how to ride a bicycle. Too many people think that because I understand when somebody predicts it's going to rain tomorrow, my brain understand, or maybe some part of my brain understands what it means to make a prediction. This myriological fallacy motivates predictive brain, predictive processing ideas. Humans can use representations, images of the, uh, things in the real world. Humans, and indeed dogs, can form associations. Here Pavlov dog can, Pavlov's dog can learn to associate the sound of a bell with the expectation of food turning up. In all these cases, it's the agents that are doing the representing, that are forming the associations, and not their brains or parts of their brain. If we look at the case of a hologram, the red rectangle is the uh, holographic emulsion film, which contains not an image of the statue, but an interference pattern derived from laser beams uh, and is such that when, when the emulsion film is illuminated properly, the observers looking through the film will see the holographic image behind it. 
and this is something that matters to them. They all agree on where it is. They will agree on where, on what it is holding in its right hand. So in that sense, it's objective for them. Yet if you or I go round behind the film, there's actually nothing there in that space whatsoever. So the holographic image matters to them. It is, in a sense, objective for them. And yet it is not physically in that space. It's not physically inside their brain. It's within their visual space, in some virtual visual space shared by the observers. Supposing the same observers are now discussing a cat sitting on a mat. Again, the conceptual cat on the mat isn't situated in some physical space. It's some, in some virtual conversational space. They can translate between different languages. They can agree on what the colour of the mat is. But it is not in their brain, it's in their com shared conversational space, a different space altogether. Unfortunately, GoFi, good old-fashioned AI, suffers from the meteorological confusion and has assumed that because we as humans can handle symbols, models, predictions, representations, somehow our brain or parts of our brain must contain these. Even neural network people, many of them make the same mistake. They assume that when there are neural networks in the brain, somehow within the neural network these symbols, models, etc. are encapsulated. So if we take an example style of neural network like the autoencoder, which would take on the left hand side an input layer that might take, for instance, pixels from an image, and should be trained up to produce on the output layer on the right the a, a, a matching image but passing through in the middle a narrow bottleneck which forces the information to be if you like distilled into some distributed representation perhaps analogous to the emulsion film of the hologram this is a common style of um, thinking about the job neural networks do and it leads to this kind of p um, picture of how to do for example machine translation where different languages French, English, Chinese in this case can pass through the brain and all are distilled into a universal language in the middle that is a distributed representation of all the different target languages Regrettably, the meteorological fallacy leads people to think this is, my, what, this is maybe what happens in the real brains of humans and this is how to design um, machine translation systems. This actually is not necessary at all and if you understand the, uh, how agency works, things that matter to humans and agents such as cats sitting on mats and holographic images aren't in the brain, they are out in some virtual space, they are out there, not in the brain, and there's absolutely no need for neural networks to have some central uh, distributed representation. So I'm drawing an analogy here between the holographic image that matters to the observers and yet is not situated in physical space, is certainly not uh, situated in their brains, but is situated in their shared visual space. The subject of discussion, like the cat sitting on the mat, is not physically located in space, not physically located in the observer's or discussant's brains, but it exists in their shared conversational space, as indeed the gap that matters to the sheep is not situated in the in the uh, sheep's brain, but it, it influences its behaviour. What matters to an agent or agents is located in social agent behaviour space and not in brain space. These philosophical issues actually have practical implications because they lead, uh, they shape people's approaches to designing systems. And if you get these things wrong, you might finish up in a dead end like the person on the left, 
aiming for the, the moon and starting off by climbing up a tree to get there. If you start off the wrong premises, you may well find yourself in a dead end. So it's worth spending time getting your philosophical framework right. And I've given two examples of where this has impl practical implications. For predictive processing, ideas of the predictive brain where motivated by internal models of predictions, this is simply fallacious. And the design of uh, multi-language machine translation neural networks does not need any central nexus with a distributed representation of the brain. Those are for just two example practical implications illustrating why philosophy matters. What matters now are your questions.